Cameroon. He attended um, Cameroon College of Arts, um, Science and Technology, Bambili, where he studied history, economics, and geography. Um, he is currently an associate of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard. Um, Professor Wingo has published widely on liberal democratic, sorry, I'm also letting people in, democratic philosophy and politics, particularly on institutional building in places where there are non-liberal democratic or illegitimate political institutions. Um, he is currently working on a book entitled The Citizen in collaboration with Dr. Michael Cruz. The book is about how Africans can move beyond where the history has put them and begin to make their own future and secure their own political freedom. Our second speaker will be Sarah J. Purcell, sorry, Purcell, who is the L. F. Parker Professor of History at Grinnell College. Her 2002 book, Sailed with Blood, War, Sacrifice, and Memory in Revolutionary America, analyzed how early revolutionary war monuments contributed to the creation of national identities in the United States. In her book in progress titled Spectacle of Grief, Public Funerals and the Politics of Civil War Memory, links civil war memorials, um, to a larger politics of public mourning. She is the author, co-author of five other books, um, and Purcell has served as a consultant to the National Park Service on a number of monuments and historic trail projects. And she served as a content consultant to the WTDW PBS series, 10 Monuments That Changed America. Last but not least, we have Nur Eskovitz, who actually with the Applied Ethics Center actually helped put together this event. Um, but as a speaker, he's the Associate Professor of Philosophy and Founding Director of the Applied Ethics Center at UMass Boston. Before coming to UMass, he was an Associate Professor of Legal and Political Philosophy at Suffolk University, where he co-founded and directed the Graduate Program in Ethics and Public Policy. Professor Eskovitz's research focuses on transitional justice, the culture of war, and the ethics of technology. His books include A Theory of Truces, Sympathizing with the Enemy, Reconciliation, Transitional Justice and Negotiation, Theorizing Transitional Justice, and the forthcoming Glory, Humiliation, and the Drive to War. Um, with that being said, I want to just give a brief round of applause for all our speakers. Thank you for being here today. And Ajume Wingo already has his presentation up. As we can see, it's How Not to Refound America, Putting Loveliness into Monuments. So with that being said, Ajume, you have the floor. I'm just going to make sure you're unmuted and I'll mute myself. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Leonard, uh, uh, for this wonderful introduction. Even though my new book is actually called In the Shade of Power, uh, and I'm no longer at the divorce institute, so that's fine. And thank you, Nay. Uh, so, Okay, my, my presentation, as you see, is titled How Not to Refound America, Putting Loveliness into Monuments. Uh, it's not, the slide is not moving. Hello? Oh, okay. Wonderful. So, uh, as I start, I start by saying that America has a problem that has haunted its people since its foundation. It is an apathetic wage between its black and white races. This problem requires a serious solution and sort of grave solution, the refounding of America. But there are many ways of not refounding America, which I will address uh, in this presentation. Uh, let me express what the problem is so that I'm not the one making the problem up. Uh, first, uh, not long ago, Prince Harry uh, said this. He said that uh, that he was not aware of what it feels like to live in a world, and I quote, created by white people for white people. He said this in the, he said it while sitting by his wife, whose mother is black, <clears throat> and within the context of, uh, of the protest against white racism uh, that we are going on and still going on now. 
Then we go back, uh, Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, who left France to study democracy in America, said this. He said the most formidable of all ills that threaten the future of the union arises from the presence of a black population upon its territory. He said this uh, while commenting that there was nothing in the constitution that showed that black people were part of the union. And that's why you could predict this many, many years. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the, the same president of the United States, said this. While many people were worried about slavery, he said nothing is more certain written in the book of faith than that these people are to be free. Nor is it less certain that the two races equally free cannot live in the same government. So you will uh, take this view very seriously. Two races equally free cannot live in the same government. Then there was a deputation of blacks. Some of the blacks, they had people represented, the representative of blacks who approached Abraham Lincoln and asked him to found a colony for them in South America. So they too believe that the two races equally free cannot live together. And then the early abolitionists advocated for the creation of Liberia so blacks could move there. Now, let me still highlight the problem moving forward. The, one of the ways to highlight is probably look at Dreskart versus Sanford, where the Supreme Court uh, declared that blacks are not and cannot be citizens of the United States. Also, the, the, the second thing that I want to highlight is that T showing the problem, the depth of the problem. The emancipation of slaves was just that, an emancipation and nothing else. It was actually an expediency by Abraham Lincoln, as he said that my, the, uh, my essence is, to, is, to, uh, is for the union, and if it takes freeing some slaves, or freeing no slaves, or freeing some and leaving some in bondage to achieve the union, that's what I would do. And so slaves were probably freed on that context. I think that there's more to Abraham Lincoln than this. And then we know about the Jim Crow laws of uh, equal but separate. And then during the COVID-19 that threatened uh, uh, the pandemic, that, uh, that, that threatened our humanity, you had the Chukwu death of a black man, George Floyd, in the police custody in May 25th, uh, 220 by a white police officer, and the shooting death of Brenna Taylor, a 26 year old black man, a black woman. Now, the, the Black Lives Matter, the slogan for the protest in major cities during, was the strong for the protests in major cities during the pandemic. Of course, Black Lives Matter to Blacks and their supporters, but not just to the state, which they call their own. So let's look at this. Jefferson, two races equally free cannot live together. This leaves the uh, leaves United States with options. The first option is white subjugate Black. Black subjugate white, option two. Option three, white found a colony, say in Jupiter, and deport, black, uh, and deport blacks there. Black found a colony in Mars, on Mars, and deport whites there. Or they can engage in the war of annihilation of both races. Or six, find a way to live together. And this is uh, by what I call the founding of America, by the founding America. It feels to the black population that the whites have taken the, 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 the option one, which is, as previously stated, the option one is subjugate black people. As long as you keep them subjugated, then you can live your life. Now, the refounders are in favor of option six, 
find a way to live together. And uh, you have these founders, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, they're, they're basically the civil rights activists and the progressives, and then assuming. Uh, let's look at uh, how not to refound America and want to look at the Civil Rights Act. Uh, during the, the funerals of late Congressman John Lewis, America praised him as the founder of a more fuller and fairer and better America. He, he praised Congressman John Lewis as, a found, as the founder of a more fuller and by doing that he was actually referring to a civil right uh, uh, the civil right activism with Martin Luther King that uh, led to the civil right uh, act <clears throat> of uh, 1964 and then you have the civil right activists uh, they, uh, anyway I think I'm jumping the civil rights activists like Martin Luther King must construe the effect for the cause. And then Jim Crow laws were the effect of a deepest <coughs> existential problem. And Jim Crow law uh, uh, specifically targeted blacks, but the civil rights act that ensued was open-ended and targeted everyone, everyone or no one in particular. 50 years and counting since the passing of the act and the police racism uh, persists and protesters use the slogan black life matter because they feel that black life does not matter the progressivism or uh, socialism and the, the fullness of time as i entitled this uh, this uh, part like the civil rights act proponents the progressives mistake the effect for the cause the effect are uh, mundane, but the cause is transcendental. John Dewey was an, was an up opponent of uh, opponent, uh, proponent of progressivism. He had found he was not unaware of the problem of African American or black people. He, he had found the NAACP, the American Liberty Union, and the American Federation of Teachers. The progressive belief in chipping away bit by bit at the problem with the hope that in the fullness of time, justice shall be at the end of the long-winded arc of history. The progress will begin by rejecting the natural right on which, the, on which America was founded and the ensuing limited government to protect the right natural to its people. They opened it with, with the new view that rights are created and the government should be should be, should be big or capacious enough to create the condition for the rights. Then um, the example of the progressivism was uh, FDR, New Deal, and uh, LBJ's <coughs> Great Society. And during question and answer, I can elaborate on this. Now, criticism of the fullness of time approach came from no other than Martin Luther King Jr. In his letter from Birmingham, from Birmingham jail, he said, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. <laughs> when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse kick, brutalize, and even kill your, brother, your, your black brothers and sisters with impunity. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. So this just highlights that the problem persists, white and black, and one subjugating the other in order to survive. <clears throat> How to refound an America of black and white with transcendental and existential force so powerful as to dry up the wage of apathy that has for so long haunted, haunted its citizenry. Now, <clears throat> this is my view. You have a founding of a state has two dimensions. One, 
the spiritual to the mundane or the rational. And it happens in this order. The spiritual first and then the, the, the mundane or the rational next. <clears throat> the spiritual is the peace. Is, a, is the peace of our humanity. It happens the secret to, to, the, to the big answers to our existence. The soul bonding of people. And there are various bonding that we can imagine. The, the secret to our existence is with people. As he said in uh, John Beatty, an African said, I am because we are. And since we are, therefore I am. And uh, where I come from, it is said that a person is a person because of a person. But there are many ways of bonding. You have friends. You have family. You have tribe. You have ethno or ethnic group. You have race. And, uh, and, uh, and then you have a well-ordered politics as the biggest and most formidable that bring all people together, that bring all of these other bondings together. That's why politics matter a lot for, it, for our existence, for giving us the purpose and the meaning of life. The spiritual is a level of silent, primitive, tacit consent by feeling, not by, not, not by cogitation. It is a level of, of non-rational and as so the dichotomy between rationality and irrationality are neither applicable nor useful. The non-rational generate the emotion that under, that, no, that under give, sorry, not undermine. It generate the emotion, the emotion that supports rationality or reason. The proper language of, uh, of non, the prior language of non-rationality is art and aesthetic. Uh, the dimension of rationality, mundane contract, signing, signing of document and public, that's the second uh, dimension. In our specific case at hand is the dimension of the declaration of independence in the written document, the constitution, uh, statutes, laws of all sorts. It is also the area of our material life and the existence of our intellect. Now, to reform, we start with the non-rational and then, then we go to the rational. The problem with the civil rights uh, activists and the progressivists is that they had it backward at best or ignored the spiritual dimension and worse. The reason is that modern Western bureaucratic rationalist states, of which America is one, they are organized precisely to push out the non-rational for reason that, we, we, that, uh, that I can tell you during uh, uh, Q and, uh, question and answer, Q and A. An analogy with marriage is in place. Marriage doesn't, you don't start marriage from the wedding. When you start marriage through bonding, you first start by the, the couples or the would-be uh, couple, they, uh, in the dyadic relation, dyadic rela they start by bonding. They start by dissolving the, the orderness and, and merging into one, into oneness by recognizing each other's humanity. They start from, uh, 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 from this kind of non-rational level. This is a sort of quiet, tacit uh, 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 level, the merging of the soul, as I will put it uh, this way. And the, the, the founding of a state is not any different. The founding of the state then it's day after that, the, then when this is all done, then it is after that, that the, 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 that the family, that they can get together now, that the wedding, the formal wedding, the exchange of gifts and all these things can take place. It's not the other way around. So uh, 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 the donors and the, and the I, I entitled this one uh, uh, the, the, now, Randall Kennedy, uh, uh, sorry, 
Randall Robinson speak like an American, an intellectual and a black human being. In his book, The Dead, he made a case as an American intellectual on why blacks are owed money from the government. This guy, the kind of thing that Lincoln took about 40 acres of land and, and a mill, or today we translate to and a Lexus or something. Now, when he talks, he talks in terms of dollars. When he talks as an intellectual, as an American, he talks in dollars. Now, when he shifts to speaking like a black human being, he puts he puts on himself at the non-rational dimension of the capital of the United States and then express his feeling from deep in his soul by saying this. I look straight up and immediately saw the callous irony, wondering if the slaves who had helped to erect the structure might have bristled at it as quickly as, as I, symbolizing the carapace, the carapace of American liberty, 60 old rope figures are arranged in heroic attitudes around the majestic Washington, before whom a white banner, before whom a white banner is on foil, bearing the Latin phrase, a pluribus honor, or one out of many. But all the many in the fiasco are white. Now, the protesters, uh, protesters uh, bringing down monuments have the right into it. Americans at the existing, existential dimension is made of monuments. They are wrong in thinking that the monument responsible for the apathetic divide between the black and white races are the Confederate monuments. The heart of the problem is that the monuments are all white made by white for white. Think for a moment about all of the monuments in the United States. Think of numismatic symbolism and feel the weight, not of an individual monument, but of all of them as they wear upon you, upon your soul. And you can begin to have a glimpse into what I'm saying. You can begin to feel what I'm saying. Engagement and wedding rings are like monuments. They express the feeling to the wearer, who they are and what they stand for. Political monuments are likewise. They express to the citizen what, who they are and what they stand for. Uh, let me conclude with a closing remark, remark of a conversation between Ngonso, uh, my Marcelina ancestor, the princess who founded our enduring state of Nso in Cameroon, and Simaa, the name actually means is war, <laughs> an intellectual. Simaa, feeling is stupid. Stupidity is bad for us. Ngonso, Feeling feels wonderful, and it is the will on which our world runs. That's all. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Jume. So I'm just, so thank you. I'm just going to make sure you're muted. Um, but moving forward, the next speaker is going to be Sarah Purcell. And as a reminder, her, the title of her talk is War Monuments and Values, Permanence, Universalism, and Change in the United States. So with that, I'll mute my mic and Sarah, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Ajume, very much. Um, let me see here. I am, I need to, I was trying to share my screen. Let's see what happened. It didn't, ha it, Dana, you're not seeing the slides yet, right? Let me try that again. strange. Yeah, so I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, it's uh... Oh, there we go. Did you get it now? So I can't see it. It's a little broken up. Strange. With the hmm. chat. Okay, well, can you see that or? 
Yes. It's, okay, we'll, we'll start there. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Um, my camera also has something where it's flickering a little bit. So maybe it's uh, interfering with the slides. So if at some point you just totally can't see something, let me know and I can always uh, put it up again later. But I really appreciate being here. Um, I really appreciate the interdisciplinarity of this. And I think um, it's, uh, you'll see that there are lots of themes that speak to each other, even though I'm coming at this from um, quite a different perspective. So um, as Dana said, um, the themes I'm going to talk about today are it, looking at war monuments, uh, particularly in the United States, um, and values, the tensions between permanence, universalism, and change. Um, and of course, we've all been brought up um, uh, very much to attention in the past four or five months, um, especially since May, but really since 2015, um, and again in 2017, and again in 2020, um, with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and as part of the protests um, that are trying to draw attention to the movement for Black Lives, um, there has been um, a a concerted effort to take down, especially Confederate monuments um, like this one. And you see here, this is uh, Stonewall Jackson um, on the Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. And this is a, a before and after in July um, where you see the monument having been uh, defaced as its defenders would say. Um, and then the monument itself has been removed um, in July and just the plinth uh, is still standing. So we can see that um, something in the movement for racial and uh, political justice and equality um, has moved people to um, go after these monuments. And so that's what I want to put into a little bit of historical context and then make, we're going to come back around to this and make some suggestions for um, his, how history speaks to this moment today. Um, one reason that um, these monuments have become so important is exactly what Ajume was alluding to, that um, monuments are like the wedding bands, right? They are very much um, meant to symbolize the values of a society. Um, from the very beginning of the United States, there is an idea that physical monuments are supposed to set aside space for the enshrinement of particular values. Um, and Americans build monuments in order to um, pay homage and reverence to ideas and values, and particularly to people who embody those ideas and values. And the notion is that a public space, such as you see here with the National Mall in Washington, DC, is supposed to be set aside permanently. Um, the traditional, and indeed you might even call it the classical idea of monuments, is that they are permanent markers of a particular kind of value in public space. Um, and until recently, you know, monuments were really seen to be um, something that was supposed to last forever and would enshrine a certain reading of those values um, into the future. So they were erected for the present time and also for the future. Um, this is taken um, in true American style, uh, kind of a mishmash of um, Egyptian, Roman, even some Greek views in there, but Americans just kind of throw together in the 18th and 19th century. Um, they cherry pick those classical ideas. So you see here, for instance, uh, Trajan's column, um, the notion of erecting um, a physical monument um, that, that in this case, uh, praises the hero and also the Republic itself. And that's what Americans are shooting for, the, to set aside that space to kind of praise themselves. Um, and so I want to give some examples of how uh, that process worked in the early United States and then how that process began to change and what that might say about um, potential for changing monuments in the present um, and the more recent past as well. Um, from the beginning, even though monuments were supposed to be um, a permanent marker of values, um, there are always tensions. Right? You, nothing is as simple, right, as monument builders want to make it, um, even from the beginning. Um, and one example of this would be uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, and this is Joseph Warren, a statue of Joseph Warren, um, one of the great heroes of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, he was a major general, newly commissioned in the Continental Army, um, who was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill and became seen as a great martyr of that battle. 
And one might expect um, a monument to Joseph Warren um, to be the focus of praise for the Battle of Bunker Hill. And in fact, you can see sort of versions of that. Um, think of John Trumbull's history painting, The Death of Dr. Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. That, that would be an example of, of such a thing. And indeed, um, the very first monument to the Battle of Bunker Hill was a statue um, very much like this one. This one's basically a reproduction of it, um, which was a, a sort of traditional um, somewhere between classical and neoclassical, um, neoclassical rendition in, in white marble of Joseph Warren to take the hero's martyred body and make it on the site of the battle where people could come and visit and pay it tribute. Um, but then, and then also, so this focused American attention on heroism, the idea of um, a great man, and it's definitely gendered male, um, a great man that Americans would come and pay attention to. And at the same time, therefore, they would renew their attentions to the patriotic cause or to the nation, um, to whatever the American Revolution was supposed to stand for, um, the Republic at that time. Um, early on, however, in the first 50 years of the United States, um, there was, however, a much larger effort uh, to build this, which probably looks familiar to many of you if you're there in Boston, um, the Bunker Hill Monument, as it's now known. Um, this obelisk, take, taking the form of the obelisk, um, in this case from Egyptian tradition, um, and putting it on the site of the Battle of Bunker Hill in Charlestown. Um, and if you look closely, you can see there's still a, um, there's still a figural monument of a person at the base, but that we would, um, that the planners of the monument chose this design on purpose um, because it would put together the idea of heroism explicitly into a non-figural form. And that's because they planned the Bunker Hill Monument um, in 1824, 1825, when the cornerstone was laid, um, to really be a monument that would enshrine public space for all the men who fought at Bunker Hill, especially for the men who were killed, but everyone who fought in the battle on the American side, not just for Joseph Warren. He still would be, um, would be uh, given special praise, but that the monument is actually a little bit more democratic, right, than that. It praises all the men who are at Bunker Hill. Um, note, it's still, it's still very vague. Um, it just has kind of general Republican patriotic tendencies, but um, it doesn't exactly tell you, it doesn't have a list of names. Um, and so it, people can kind of make it into what they want to make it into, an object of praise and a memorial um, for people. Um, you can note that it's, it, therefore, it has the chance to possibly efface um, almost as much as it praises because, for instance, there's nothing about this monument that tells you that scholars would now say between 20 and 25 percent of the soldiers who fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill on the American side were African-American or indigenous soldiers. Um, but for the most part, public memory uh, includes only white soldiers in this memory, um, for the most part, with some small exceptions. We can talk about that um, again later on. Um, but it's just intended to be um, a general public space. And so there's, even starting from the early days of the Republic, this tension between um, enshrining the heroism of individuals who are officers, who are well-born, who are representative men of the society, and a more generalized um, military sacrifice. And you can see that even here in the Bunker Hill Monument. So that's there even from the, the late 18th, early 19th century. Now, many scholars, um, especially European scholars, his, scholars of European history, um, argue that this kind of monument that um, enshrines the sacrifice of fighting men more generally really did not arise until the 20th century. So for example, um, we see here the Tomb of the Unknowns in Paris and really that it's World War I, um, scholars like Jay Winter and, and others have argued that World War I really brings about the advent of the monument which praises the common man, um, the common fighting man in some way in Europe. Um, and while that may be largely true um, for European precedent, it is not entirely true in the United States because what we just saw, the Bunker Hill Monument, for instance, having this tension between Joseph Warren, the officer, and 
the men um, generally who sacrificed. Um, it was really actually, however, the US Civil War um, in the middle of the 19th century that really spread this idea of monuments to the average fighting American soldier. Um, and sometimes even sailor, but average fighting soldier just as a kind of shorthand. So this, for instance, is the Tomb of the Unknowns uh, from the Civil War at Arlington National Cemetery. Now, albeit, I will say this particular monument was constructed in the period of World, World War I. So you might see some link to this 20th century transition that European historians are looking at with this particular example. But it is nonetheless a monument to soldiers of the Civil War. And in fact, the most common monuments in the United States are monuments to the US Civil War, most common war monuments. And the most common form is in fact, um, will demonstrate that this transition towards the sacrifice of average men, a somewhat democratizing um, impulse was really popular. Now, the thing that happens, however, is in monuments in the 19th century to the US Civil War, the same tension that we saw at Bunker Hill between Joseph Warren on the one hand and the common men who fought at Bunker Hill on the other hand is very much present in the, in the commemorative landscape of the US Civil War. Because we have both kinds of monuments um, just growing exponentially across the American landscape. So we continue to have a huge number of important monuments constructed in the decades after the Civil War, um, starting a little bit right after, but really accelerating um, in the 1890s, um, 1890s into the first part of the 20th century, um, to the officers, so men who would be analogous to Joseph Warren. So for instance, um, this is Robert E. Lee, um, also from Monument Avenue in uh, Richmond, Virginia. The equestrian monument, um, it tries to use sometimes sort of classical but also European precedent, the mounted commander, um, and is really there to praise the values of the Confederacy as embodied by the commander Robert E. Lee. Um, lots and lots of examples. Here's that same Stonewall Jackson monument I showed you at the beginning um, in calmer days for Stonewall Jackson um, there on Monument Avenue. These are not just uh, Confederate style monuments. There are also many, many monuments to Union officers that have a somewhat similar form. So for instance, this is the monument to William T. Sherman that's in New York City. And um, so these are very heroic traditional monuments um, showing us sort of the great man theory of history and enshrining the value of heroic sacrifice of the great individual um, in American history. Um, and these are very, very important um, monuments. However, far more common in the, in the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century is this monument, um, the monument that is known by many scholars as the Standing Soldier Monument, um, but monuments that are explicitly made to praise regular enlisted fighting soldiers, sometimes sailors, um, in the Civil War. They're not made for officers, they're made for average soldiers. They're usually not sculpted um, in order to depict a particular soldier. So it's not a monument to uh, Joe Smith, the Civil War soldier. It's a monument to Civil War soldiers from a particular area in a particular context. Um, this is one from uh, Pierre, South Dakota. So this is actually a Union monument in Pierre, South Dakota. Um, and you can see here, this is very typical of the form. Um, some are in marble, some are in bronze. In fact, they were so um, popular that you could order them from catalogs in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century um, with different stances, different uniforms. Sometimes you could even order Confederate or Union monuments from the same catalog, um, depending which, which page you ordered from or which one you needed. Um, these are really all over the American landscape where they, they enshrined um, the sacrifice of common fighting soldiers. So here's, I could show you hundreds of examples, right? Pierre, South Dakota. Here's Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. I like this photo because you get a little better picture of the form of the monument. Um, it's, it shows, um, in this case, the Union soldier very much at rest. Um, it's not the best posture with a firearm, probably, but um, it shows you the, the 
the bronze soldier standing at rest, but in his, in his, um, in his uniform and can easily get ready to go. Um, so there are Union examples. There are also Confederate examples, many, many Confederate examples. This one is also from Richmond, Virginia, um, the common soldier. Now, what this does is it takes the sacrifice of common soldiers and it applies that universalism. It universalizes the concept of sacrifice. Um, and while not enshrining any individual common man as a, the same kind of hero as Robert E. Lee or William Tecumseh Sherman, it does put them into monumental form, um, meaning that the value of sacrifice itself is something that the nation will pay tribute to, or the locale will pay tribute to, in the case of the Confederacy. You know, the former Confederate capital is doing this. Um, Sometimes the, I'll just show one example of this. Sometimes the different monumental forms are used in conversation with one another. So you get um, a monument like this one. This is actually the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Boston um, that has kind of um, high classical forms and a standing soldier or standing sailor um, kind of in relation to one another. It also has allegorical figures and bas relief and sort of every possible form um, thrown in together to kind of pull out um, a, a more, I don't know, a more elaborate civic structure in a way. Um, but at the heart of it all is the sacrifice of the common soldier. Um, the thing I would say though is, even though this is really an innovation in the 19th century um, in the United States of having the common soldier be venerated as someone worthy of public space praising the value of, of sacrifice for the cause, whatever the cause is. Um, as lots of scholars, you know, David Blight, um, even Kirk Savage, ever, it, lots and lots of scholars have pointed out. It does, however, have the um, perhaps unintended effect of creating an equivalency between the Union soldiers and the Confederate soldiers. The only difference is the hat in some ways, right? Like they are um, roughly equivalent. Their sacrifice is the same. And the other thing that you see that is very much the same is that they are all depicted as white. Um, the physiognomy is on purpose supposed to make you think of white men's sacrifice. Um, even though in the case of the Union soldiers here, right, um, at least 180,000, probably more than 200,000 of the soldiers in the Union Army are African Americans. Um, there's no effort to try to include any kind of African American um, physical presence in monumental form. And so even while the, the work of democratization is being done, the common man, rather than the great officer, it makes that democratization explicitly white. And it makes it in some ways equivalent between North and South, even though the values were completely different in the actual war. So the monuments are doing work to kind of um, blunt and to provide um, structural racism, a, a racism that is um, making this sacrifice into white. So it may not be quite the same thing. There is a lot of um, it's, well, I'll get back to that in a minute. There's a lot of um, very clear racialized messaging when you're enshrining Stonewall Jackson or Robert E. Lee um, about the cause of the Confederacy, the oppressiveness of the institution of slavery, the violence of trying to protect the institution of slavery in the U.S. Civil War. I would say even these monuments, which are more democratic, even if to some degree, if they're about the union, because they have this generalizable message of whiteness, they also do um, the work of structural racism. Um, maybe not um, in exactly the same way, but that's very important work nonetheless. Um, we know, of course, there are a few efforts, right, to actually include black figures in Civil War monuments. So for instance, um, these are some of the men of the Massachusetts 54th Colored Regiment um, who are in the bas relief section of the Augusta St. Gaudens um, Memorial to Robert Gould Shaw, their commander. Um, this is in the Boston Common, right, right in front of the State House. Um, and St. Gaudens made a very um, concerted effort to include black men. He actually had um, men from the 54th come to his studio to model. Um, and it is one of the only, however, um, examples of 
black fighting men being shown in this kind of pose in in a march um, in a dignified way, as opposed to, for example, Ajume showed um, one of the um, emancipation monuments, even though it was funded by African American by free African Americans after the Civil War, um, showing um, enslaved people in a more subservient um, pose. Um, this is definitely not that, but it's one. It's the exception that proves the rule, right? It's the exception that proves the rule. And even here, they sort of. Um, they sort of got on, it's still the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial. Um, they are sort of there as the background, but their own power sort of transcends that um, in some ways artistically. I, if you go see it, you know, you, it's definitely, you won't forget about them at the same time. So um, I would just have a few concluding thoughts here, which is, of course, we've seen in, I'm not gonna go through every other war, but in later decades, um, in more recent decades, um, we have seen some challenging, I think, um, and a further democratization um, of war memorials. So for instance, here's Maya Lin at the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. Um, she pushed that democratization much further um, in privileging the names of the war dead and in using um, a radically different form that really departed from any neoclassical examples um, and, and kind of pushing totally away from the figural and, and, and uh, featuring the names. Um, there was, however, it doesn't depart from the basic fundamental fact of setting aside that public space for valorizing war as a basis of the American state and the American nation. Um, and so I think um, when we see today um, social justice movements um, working against monuments, you know, we shouldn't be surprised because even though the founders of these monuments um, weren't necessarily getting their way, the Stonewall Jackson monument was always contested from the first day that it was put up. Um, they did mean it to enshrine the values of the Confederacy. So we shouldn't be surprised when um, people are pushing back against the presence of the values of the Confederacy um, on today's landscape. But we also um, shouldn't be surprised when this kind of public discussion and this kind of reckoning with the meaning of our past and with monuments um, pushes outside the boundaries of just Monument Avenue and maybe into the form of monuments themselves, um, the idea of monuments themselves. I was very, very interested. I'm sure most of you saw um, the Mellon Foundation, right, is, fa is funding a new, um, I think it's $250 million grant um, to um, examine the landscape of memorials around the United States. Um, and several of the projects they're already working to fund, um, in a way, are kind of questioning the very form of the monument, even while still trying to engage in commemoration as an important value for the American nation. So I think there's a lot of questions um, about what's left to do. Is there anything going to rise in these monuments place? Are we going to leave, you know, the, the message of the, the base there? Um, and there's a lot else to do with the social movements, but the monuments are not beside the point, um, but we're left with a lot of questions about the future. Um, Though I haven't seen very many people um, really claim that we should just rid the landscape of every kind of monument. That would be an, an, an incredible undertaking. Um, but that might actually be um, a step too far because maybe it's a chance to, to build some new monuments, but the idea is to think about the values that underlay it and not to like kid ourselves that they really are going to be permanent. That's also part of it. So it'll be interesting to see where the Mellon Foundation takes it. But the fact that they're even focusing on monuments shows us that the same, the discussion from US history is still going on somewhat in the same track, even though the players are, are entirely new. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see how much challenge really comes out of it and how much doesn't. So I think I'll end there. Thank you. So thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Our last speaker for today will be Nur Estevitz. And again, his presentation title is Not Set in Stone, Five Bad Arguments for Letting Monuments Stand. So Nur, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Dana, uh, for uh, helping to organize this. And um, my presentation is on 
the main arguments. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here one minute. See the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. So, um, what I want to do is um, uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the main arguments being made uh, in political discussion, in political debates. Some of these are made both by scholars and in politics about letting monuments uh, stay. Uh, and um, I think what we can learn from this uh, has to do both with the limits of our public conversation and um, how careful the arguments are or are not there, but also I think the arguments themselves teach us something about uh, the nature of monuments. So um, essentially what I'm going to do is go through what I take to be the five uh, most common arguments uh, for letting monuments stand and uh, review them together uh, with you. Let's see. Uh, the first argument is the, we might call it the rewriting history argument. And the idea here is that the removal of uh, controversial monuments amounts to uh, an erasure uh, of history. An example of this kind of claim uh, you could find in a recent editorial in the Wall Street Journal about uh, New York City's decision to uh, remove a statue of uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt from the entrance to the Museum of Natural History. And uh, the editorialist in the Wall Street Journal writes that doing that is a willy-nilly eradication of chunks of American uh, history and versions of that. Um, uh, kind of argument have been made more and more uh, frequently. Uh, but the thing is, of course, that monuments are not history. They are, at best, cliches or caricatures of history. A monument freezes one moment or feature in the life of the person that it depicts, and the historical, uh, historical evaluation would have to involve a uh, panoramic views. In some ways, monuments are the opposite uh, of history. So take, for an example, Churchill's famous monument in London's uh, Parliament Square. It's based on a photograph of him uh, inspecting some bombing sites in London uh, uh, during the Blitz. Uh, so it captures one aspect of Churchill's uh, life, his leadership in World War II, which by most accounts was uh, competent and uh, admirable. But would removing it be an erasure of history? And I think the answer to that is uh, no. In fact, if all the history that you knew had to do with that aspect of Churchill's life, you would miss his uh, uh, racism towards the uh, empire subject in Britain, and you would miss uh, uh, much of the uh, ridicule in which he was held actually uh, uh, leading up to the war. So history is much more complicated than what a monument uh, uh, can convey. Monuments, if you want, are history for people who uh, uh, couldn't bother. Uh, the cliff notes of cliff notes, uh, they stir emotions, they may inspire curiosity, but uh, they don't really uh, by themselves uh, teach. And I think it's important to remember that this kind of argument cuts uh, both ways, just like removing a problematic monument is not erasing history. Building a new monument to a worthy cause or figure is not the filling of a historical uh, uh, lacuna. There's just a distinction between monuments and history. So I think that argument uh, uh, doesn't work. Um, the other argument that you hear all the time is the um, ex post facto moralizing uh, argument. So the argument here is something like this. Uh, monuments, removing monuments, imposing the moral standards uh, that we have today onto figures from the past who are ignorant about those. It's, uh, and that's uh, 
unfair. Uh, would we want to be judged in this way uh, by future generations? Uh, would we want to be judged by uh, standards that are not present uh, uh, to us? Um, so there's two problems uh, with this argument. First of all, it just empirically uh, usually doesn't make sense. Uh, our contemporary moral standards uh, actually would be recognizable to those who lived uh, uh, in earlier uh, eras. There's a quote there from a letter by uh, Colonel uh, uh, John Lawrence, Hamilton's uh, uh, close friend, uh, from the heart of uh, uh, the South Carolinian uh, establishment of the American founding generation. He writes, uh, about slavery, if as some pretend, but I am persuaded more through interest than from conviction, the culture of the ground with us cannot be carried on without African slaves, let us fly it as a hateful country and say, ubi libertas, ibi patria, my uh, homeland is where liberty is or um, uh, uh, something close to that. So first of all, it's just not true in many cases that the moral standards are uh, uh, retroactively uh, applied. The moral possibilities actually quite often are present in the generation that we are uh, uh, judging ex post facto. There might not be the same kind of uh, consensus about them as we have now, but that is different from saying that we are uh, uh, willy-nilly uh, importing or exporting our uh, contemporary moral uh, uh, standards. Uh, but I think there's a stronger reply uh, to this worry, and that is that ex post facto moralizing is just fine. That is how reputations uh, uh, work by definition. What we reject and what we honor changes over time. And having a statue erected in your honor shouldn't be and isn't a guarantee for an eternity of reverence. We regularly reevaluate our own moral standing as well as that of our parents, our relatives, and our friends. So some of us, although not everybody, is, uh, finds themselves, uh, for example, uh, quite embarrassed or horrified by how uh, uh, they behaved when they were younger and our views of our parents and our relatives uh, change. There's no statues to them, but the fact that there is a statue to doesn't exempt you from that broad social psychological uh, dynamic. Reputations are built on moral assumptions about what's honorable and about the rank ordering of values and both these assumptions and these hierarchies change and as a result, so do uh, uh, reputations. Uh, reputations almost by definition sink. We have this fantasy, you know, gleamed as far back as uh, Pericles' funeral oration that uh, uh, all uh, monuments uh, uh, monumentalize reputations forever, but I think Shelley there on the right, you have a quote from his famous Azamandis uh, poem was closer to the mark. Azamandis is a poem about uh, somebody who sees the remains uh, of a uh, large statue in the desert and on the base of it, there is uh, uh, in part this uh, uh, inscription, my name is Azamandis, king of king, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. So Azamandis, obviously glorifying himself and all that's left is the broken uh, uh, plaque that says that. In some ways, that's how reputations work more broadly. Uh, and incidentally, just as reputations can sink, or not just as, but at least in theory, just as reputations can uh, sink, they can uh, improve uh, over time. Somebody who is views, viewed with indifference uh, or derision may in time come to be viewed in light of changed values, hierarchies of values, circumstances, uh, you know, how crappy their competitors were uh, uh, differently. So a version of that has happened to uh, Thomas Cromwell, a version of that has happened to Machiavelli, to Hamilton himself. Uh, there's examples of that, uh, obviously, with, for literary and philosophical works. So that's the ex post facto uh, uh, moralizing uh, worry. The third argument is uh, particularly interesting, and it's a classical liberal argument. It's uh, uh, based on John Stuart Mill's uh, argument in, uh, on liberty for free speech. And part of why Mill says that um, 
uh, controversial speech uh, uh, has to be uh, uh, vigorously defended is that confronting it attaches you to your true opinions that confront what he calls confrontation with uh, error confrontation with offensive and wrong beliefs cements and alivens your own attachments to uh, uh, the truth to well-founded views and without that type of confrontation our own views begin uh, to uh, uh, feel like and be held like uh, uh, dogma there's that nice quote from mill whose picture is on the top there both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field. Now, do monuments really work? So, so the idea would be you have to have offense, you have to leave up some of these uh, problematic and offensive monuments that, so that they could serve as provoca provocation, so they can serve as conversation starters, so that they can sort of disturb us into a, a, a vigorous defense of uh, decent, more decent, more socially just values. I, I doubt that monuments really work that way, though. Uh, it seems to me that those who are hurt by racist monuments don't need the confrontation uh, in order to be uh, remain connected to uh, uh, their own positions. Uh, and uh, others, far from being provoked, usually tend to look right through the monuments. Uh, you don't see too many families, you know, stopping by and saying, oh, what's this? And then there's somebody knowledgeable enough to say, oh, this is a monument to this terrible thing. And the con it, it, just like social life doesn't happen like that. Now, even if it did, though, even if monuments did serve as a wake up call for those of us whose commitments to justice are abstract and dogmatic, it's still a big, big question whether that benefit such as it is, is worth the cost of that the monuments exact in humiliation and degradation. The question from the receiving end of racism is this, is the injury the monuments inflict on those who walk by them worth the hypothetical benefit that they impart by awakening those of us who are complacent? And it seems to me pretty troubling to ask one group to agree to continued humiliation so that another can become more politically aware. There, there are probably other ways that are both more evocative and less costly, like looking at YouTube uh, or watching the news on every given day or watching a documentary that uh, could serve the same sort of contending with error kind of argument. So I think this one uh, uh, fails as well. Um, the red herring argument is the fourth argument that I wanted to look at. Um, and. Uh, that claim is essentially, and again, this is a claim that's made both from the right and the left, just like the previous uh, argument. The red herring argument is something like um, that the monuments debate is so polarizing and goes so much to the core of people's uh, identity that it's a distraction and that it trips up uh, the potential and possibility of actually arriving at practical accommodations and real progress and that too much is sacrificed to symbols uh, and uh, that comes at the express uh, of real uh, accommodations that could be made between the parties. Uh, so it takes the air out of the uh, uh, what can be achieved if you want. Uh, the historian David Alsoga for The Guardian uh, was writing recently about Britain's statue wars that allowing the statue issue to get in the way of the anti-racism debate would be a mistake and would empower objects that we mostly ignore, namely the statues. Um, so I think this type of argument, uh, perhaps well-intentioned or probably well-intentioned at least sometimes, uh, underestimates both the harm that's caused by problematic monuments and the political potential of symbols. So walking by a statue that tramples on your uh, basic uh, identity uh, and uh, or a statue of somebody who didn't think you're a human being uh, on a daily basis on the way to work is not just symbolic or figurative damage, that's actual uh, damage. Uh, and on the other hand, symbolic gestures are not fake or symbolic gestures are profoundly uh, significant and can have very real political effects. Symbolic moves like the toppling of a racist monument, but also public apologies and gestures of contrition can summarize or crystallize the collective sentiment of anger, of relief, of reconciliation, and change our attitudes. I think about 
uh, Willy Brandt, the West German uh, uh, counselor, is uh, falling to his knees in 1970s. I should have put up a, a, a picture of that uh, at the monument to the Warsaw, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Uh, and that had an electrifying uh, effect, for example, on uh, uh, Holocaust survivors and many Israelis were wondering whether there really is a new uh, Germany. It served to uh, legitimize the uh, ongoing uh, uh, German reparations uh, program and was deeply uh, uh, significant from a practical uh, standpoint. Finally, there's the slippery slope uh, argument that's maybe the most popular argument uh, made against uh, the removal of monuments and memorials, and it is a uh, time-honored uh, conservative argument in public uh, policy. The most recent and famous uh, uh, version of this was made by President uh, uh, Trump, who uh, uh, um, asked if uh, after the removal of the E. Lee and the Stonewall Jackson, monuments, uh, Jefferson and Washington monuments uh, uh, would be uh, next. But uh, in fairness, Trump didn't invent this type of argument. We've heard it uh, many times in the history of uh, the American cultural wars. For example, in the death with dignity debate, the worry was that if you allow, if you open the door for that, you end up with elective euthanasia for uh, passing problems and the legalizing of marijuana debates. Uh, if you do that, you end up with uh, a, a much larger addiction problem. Uh, and there's, I think, two obvious problems with these types of arguments, which are, again, very popular in public policy. One is that worries about slipping down the slope can never justify refusing to start down the slope. All that they can justify is descending the slope carefully and stopping where it's appropriate to stop. That may be difficult, but if that worries someone, they shouldn't be in politics. The idea is to figure out the rationale for what you're doing and then to carefully consider if that rationale justifies the next step or not. And that is uh, uh, part of the nature of uh, competent uh, policy making. And if somebody were to say, well, that's not how actually, how policy actually works, that's how policy should work. So that would be simply accepting a very bad version of public policy as a justifi justification for um, inaction. And uh, finally, Slippery slope arguments have a uh, irrational uh, prejudice for the future over the present. Uh, they're focused on the dangers in the future that a current act might bring. That obscures the costs of doing nothing in the present. The future harms are necessarily by, defini by definition uh, uh, speculative and future risks either come true or not. Uh, removing Confederate monuments may or may not open the floodgates to other removals, which may or may not be more difficult to justify, but keeping them is already causing harm, already taking a toll. And humiliation and intimidation, for example, on current members of our society. So those move to inaction by the slippery slope argument are positing that speculative uh, dangers are uh, more significant than uh, existing ones. So these, uh, I take it, are the main uh, arguments uh, about statue removal. And I think they, in addition to uh, suggesting that our level of public discussion around this can be uh, enriched, also, uh, I think, teach us something about our own prejudices around the nature of monuments assumptions about uh, um, their permanence, assumptions about uh, uh, the legitimacy of uh, uh, judging the past as if we don't judge the past uh, all the time. So I will stop here and would be happy to take any questions uh, in the Q&A. So thank you, Nur, and thank you all of our speakers. Um, for the Q&A, again, I don't have anything in my queue as of now, so if anyone does have a question, you're more than welcome to begin. If not, I, I have, I composed a question for us to begin, but I'll just give it a one second in case anyone raises their hand or uses the chat. All right, 
So again, feel free to use the chat or raise your hand in case you do have a question in the future. Um, but one thing I really thought of while everyone was speaking was the connection of monuments to actual political communities. So Jume was bringing up the idea, at least for me, with the refounding of also reconciliation, um, of changing of what the nation means for people, but also with Sarah, the idea of universalism and democratization of not only monuments, but who they represent in a polity became apparent. And lastly, Nur, when you're talking of five arguments against the removal of monuments or why these arguments failed, I was again, what was brought up was present harms, of ameliorating present harms as being part of the work of addressing monuments. So if all three of you, or if anyone would like to discuss, uh, what are the connections with monuments to political communities? How do you see that as being operative? Because I, I was seeing themes, but I was wondering what you all think more explicitly given the connections with your pieces. Yeah, it's a good question, Dana. It's really an interesting thread between um, maybe all three of our, our talks too, even though they're pretty different. Um, I think that um, one of the issues is um, that I see it is that the monuments in the past envisioned political community right in in a particular way and then the point is that the the community itself and values and citizenship and all kinds of other sense of communities have moved on but the monument is still there and even though um, i would argue that monuments are never as absolute as their creators want them to be um, it they do retain right some I don't know, some stain of the values that are originally put there in many cases, right? And or they give fire to people in political communities um, who would want to be divisive or who would want to look to the past or who would want, you know, they can, they can give people ways to justify their own vision of political community in the present in a way that downplays present harm as you're talking about, right? So um, it gets to near what you were saying that, um, you know, people are being confronted with these monuments on a daily basis and especially when they're on um, state property or they're maintained by uh, state interests there's no question that that absolutely does harm to people um, and those are people in many cases in minoritized populations who the creators of the monuments definitely meant to exclude, right? That was the whole point. They didn't, they were not seen as part of the political community, but now they are and should be. And so um, I think that the persistence of those monuments does show, you know, despite some divided purpose, there can be some harmful persistence of values from the past um, in that public space. Yeah, um, I think I am completely on board with what Sarah said. And, you know, to also touch on something that Ajumi said um, earlier, it's true that monuments uh, have an expressive uh, value or a sort of declarative value or try to have a declarative value on who we are and as a result also declare who we are not and who doesn't count uh, uh, in what we are. Um, and in a way that's part of what the people who are making the red herring type argument are saying. They're saying, you know, this raises those kind of passions because, um, I, you know, I, I'm thinking for example about a recent controversy uh, here about uh, a, a sta here in Boston about a statue of Christopher Columbus uh, uh, in the North End that ended up uh, uh, de decapitated or the debates uh, uh, that we're having here in different uh, institutions about changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And, uh, you know, you, you'd have people from the Italian American community saying, you know, symbols of Columbus are central to who we are. This is uh, uh, our legacy. And then you have people with a native heritage saying, well, if those are celebrated, then it's clearly uh, uh, expresses that we can't be who we are or we are doesn't matter in public space. And so, 
you know, one conclusion from that, the red herring conclusion from that was don't go there, don't have these debates, it's a waste of time and uh, uh, it's impractical. Um, you could also have a, at least a broader uh, set of declarations on who we are. I mean, it seems like wishful thinking to uh, uh, start hoping that people don't take symbolic expression seriously. Anyway, uh, yes, uh, I want to recognize my former colleagues from UMass Boston, uh, Larry Brom and uh, Roma. Thank you guys very much for coming. Okay, uh, the question is the relevance or the connection between these monuments and, uh, and our actual political community. Skips. Um, um, I earlier on have written a book uh, entitled "Veil Politics in Liberal Democratic States," and I look at symbols, rituals, traditions, ceremonies, and their relevance to uh, politics. And uh, one of the things that I, I we shouldn't focus just on monuments. Monument is just part of the big architecture of, uh, of non-rational stuff in our political life. Pol states are abstract. These monuments and other things that I call fair, they help to reify the state. <clears throat> and also the biggest gift that anybody can give anybody or that any polity can give to a citizen is to give them a reason to die. And the language that is used to express this, the language is the non-rational language, and that non-rational language, part of it has to do with these monuments and the rest of the symbolism. In fact, these are very, very dangerous and uh, uh, because <clears throat> uh, uh, around, I think Nazi Germany used this as a kind of uh, agitprop, kind of political, uh, use it for, for, uh, for political purposes. Sure, they are used for political purposes, but Nazi Germany brought it to fall. And you can see when you connect with a transcendental, when you are able to latch on to people exist, uh, uh, to the big question of life, by which I call the human existence. When you latch on to that, people will turn around and they'll kill their own brothers and sisters with, uh, with ease. So, I, 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 I haven't said this. All I'm saying is that monuments are very important. They are here. They've been here. They will continue to be here. But there's a reason why, uh, why modern states after 1945, why the, why the, the, the government are organized such, that, such, such as to push out, so as to narrow or to eliminate all these things, they keep on coming back and they come back for a reason. Thank you, everyone. So there are two questions in the chat. I'm gonna read them both, um, just to make sure we have time for both questions to be answered. So the first is by Ben and he says, if statues or monuments are ways of making physical embodiments of values, what possibilities are there to rethink memorialization as an activity? And he's thinking more about more vernacular ways of memorialization, such as everyday sites, objects, places that can be imbued with value. So again, um, what possibilities are there to rethink memorialization as an activity is the first question. The second question is by Naomi in the chat. And she asked um, for everyone, do you see a difference between monuments um, in celebrating a desire to remember by certain people in certain ways and memorials um, resisting a desire on the part of the more powerful to forget. So what is the difference, if at all, between monuments and memorials? 
So. Uh, if I can uh, speak to uh, Ben's question um, as a start. Um, so I am very uh, sympathetic to uh, this more, uh, if you want uh, 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 secular or um, uh, a vernacular or a humdrum uh, approach. Uh, I think it's more reflective, for example, of the fact that a lot of the values and preferences that the monuments monumentalize are not as monumentally stable as we'd like them to be. Uh, so in essence, I broadly think that monuments almost by definition uh, come with an expiration date. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and so I think there's something very attractive about that kind of uh, uh, proposal. I think people monumentalize, they always have. Uh, I think they've all, so, you know, that's both, that's fine. I think they've also, also assume, you know, and they often monumentalize the wrong things. There's often an argument as they monumentalize whether they're monumentalizing the wrong thing, but they always assume, and this is true uh, regardless of the value of the cause, they almost always assume that this is forever. Uh, and that I think uh, uh, needs to be pushed against. And I take Ben's kind of proposal to be that kind of push, if I understand the question correctly. Yeah, I think, um, I think that there's always been that kind of uh, there has been a role, especially in the 20th and now 21st centuries for that more vernacular everyday commemoration to take a larger and larger space. Um, and, you know, I mentioned, for instance, that the, the large war memorials, you know, are, have been very, very largely gendered male. Um, more vernacular uh, objects of memory um, have often been employed to commemorate uh, women's activities and 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 memory just more broadly, for instance, um, in the 20th and 21st century. And I also think you can see the power of that strategy sometimes going hand in hand with a larger um, effort to to um, monumentalize. So at the Vietnam Memorial, for instance, um, the practice of uh, bringing objects to the memorial, uh, people bringing their own um, dog tags or, you know, flowers or teddy bears, um, sometimes building on funerary practices, you know, build it, bringing um, shells or coins to the graves of, of, of the departed. Um, those kind of, those very much vernacular, but it's expressed in the case of the Vietnam Memorial in relation to the large state uh, sanctioned uh, war memorial. So sometimes they mix together. The other thing you can see is, I think you can see that the impulses being twinned in some ways, even in the political activism, it, think of in the Black Lives Matter movement, right? The, the, the constant um, reminder, uh, think of um, uh, Breonna Taylor, like say her name, that you have to repeat the names of the dead and that your activism is itself a form of remembrance of, of people who died in, in state violence, police violence, right? That, so there's that and then there's the simultaneous iconoclasm um, against Confederate memorials, that, that we're going to substitute the names of, um, of new people for the name of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. So it, it's, I think there is a kind of way in which they play off of each other. And maybe that gets a little bit to the, um, the notion in Naomi's question. I guess I don't see that much of a difference across the board between monuments and memorials, um, just because I do think that trying to enshrine the remembrance of something usually always involves the forgetting of something else. Um, there may be a difference between this vernacular expression and a more hegemonic uh, kind of expensive monument that is on in a state space or state sanctioned. Um, you know, maybe the, if, the, if a state is trying to suppress the memory of something, that's different than it just being kind of forgotten in the process. But, but I think that they're really, um, they're really mirrors of one another and they're kind of always functioning in that, in that dialogic way. Yeah, uh, mir mirroring uh, Sarah's point, Naomi, uh, and after Sarah explained it, I think I uh, uh, got the question more clearly. Um, Almost, but I mean, kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about monuments not being history, 
um, and fulfilling very uh, different roles. So even a monument to a uh, secular saint is going to uh, memorialize one aspect of their life and only one aspect of their life. And because it's in some, I mean, because in some way it's frozen and because in some way it can only uh, uh, do so much, um, you know, it ha it's editorializing one way or another, whether it's editorializing decently or not editorializing decently, it's still editorializing. So I think uh, like Sarah, that forgetting is built into uh, the practice. Uh, the, the relationship between memory and memoria is very intimate. In fact, they are they are intertwined, interlocked with one another. Uh, politics, let's, let's remember, politics is about these people in this place coming from a certain past, feel or imagine. And in politics, we don't just want to say we are all here now and dying. We are a people coming from, from a past and going to a future together. And the way that that is communicated is by using monuments and reified with memories. That is how, uh, that is how that is one of the fundamental uh, functions of uh, monuments tied with memorial in, in, in politics. As I've said, when you look at the mon monuments in the United States, and if you Look at the memory, they, they, they call the memorials. And those who create these monuments, they do it reflectively. And it tells a certain story about this nation. And the story is about white. That's it, period. Something that you would take a prince from, from England travel to United States, marry a black woman, have a child with her, to realize this. The same thing that it would take uh, uh, Jefferson, you know, uh, probably uh, um, uh, conjugating with a black woman to lament seriously, you know, what to lament seriously where we are, why, where America is going and where America is coming from. But the language is a non-rational language. The only way to communicate this is by monuments. There is no other way. When it comes down to intellectuals talking about it, then they become anxious tatarans, as I am. So I would just like to point out um, that we are past 7 p.m., but Jennifer did add an interesting book on our chat. And Naomi just wanted to further clarify that her, in her distinction between monuments and memorials, when she was thinking of memorials as the National Memorial for Peace and Justice or the Holocaust Memorial, that seemed to be a resistance to forgetting versus monuments that uh, many of us have discussed in our work. So. So wanted to make sure we pointed that out. And if anyone has any closing remarks or a very quick closing question, um, very, it might not have an answer, uh, but I just wanna give people space. Um, if not. Okay, I'm out of here, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was, I'm just gonna say that, that it'll be interesting for us all to keep our eyes on this melon project. I think a lot of new things will come out of it. Um, one thing that I'm a the only first concern I had about it was kind of that it reifies something Nir was talking about, which is the Mellon Foundation has included 
um, museums and public history in this in the same program with monuments. And I worry a little bit that that reifies that monuments are history and that there isn't any, you know, that there might not be a difference, but I think it's probably worth it to get all that money to go to creative projects that can help um, make changes in these areas. But it'll be really interesting to, to watch that. Yeah, I, I should say, Sarah, um, this is a bit, uh, you know, off the direct uh, topic that our project at the Center on Monuments started with uh, 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 creating a, a school curricula for um, sort of teaching students how to use history as a, a way of arguing uh, um, in a, a rigorous way about politics. So uh, we worked, uh, Dana and I, with uh, uh, Cambridge uh, High School here, Cambridge Public High School, uh, and made a monument for them. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, is, is that grant still open? Is the, do, do you know? They only announced it yesterday. So I think there's, <laughs> that's another thing. Keep your eye on it because you might want to apply for some money, right? That's the, um, I think they'll be funding a lot. I mean, they have already funded some projects. Um, like the um, the monument to victims of lynching uh, in the south, but I think they're they're planning a big rollout. So yeah, it just started. It was it was yesterday's New York Times had an article about it. Very cool. So of the two hundred and fifty million dollars, um, only four million dollars is accounted because they gave a gift to Monument Lab in Pennsylvania. So it seems to be two hundred and forty six million is going to be open for the grant. Wow. So. Um, but again, thank you, Nur, Sarah, and Ajume, who had to leave for, to teach class. So I'm just going to stop the recording now. So thank you, Nur, for, for earlier.